On an island off the coast of Tanzania are the ruins of a city that was a hub of global trade for centuries, right up until the Europeans showed up and spoiled everything. I'm Samir Patel, Deputy Editor of Alice Obscura, and this is Kilwa Kisawani. To get to the ruins of Kilwa Kisawani, you first have to get to the tiny island of Kilwa Masoko, get a permit, and then head to the dock at the southern end of the island and convince someone who has a boat to take you across. But as soon as you wade through the surf to the island, you'll find yourself in the ruins of maybe the greatest city of the Swahili culture. Before Europe's age of exploration, starting in the 10th century, a bunch of rich sultanates arose on the East African coast, kind of like the city-states of Renaissance Italy. The biggest was Kilwa Kisawani, which made its fortunes by playing the global markets, trading the riches of the African interior, gold, ivory, timber, spices, even slaves, to the Middle East, India, and then on to Europe, and even to China. It was even mentioned in John Milton's Paradise Lost as one of the great kingdoms of the earth. The site today is a ruin, but the standing remains are spectacular. They're all made of giant blocks of limestone called coral rag. You'll see the Great Mosque. It's the oldest standing mosque in the region, which had 16 domes originally. 10 of them are still intact. You'll see a fort called Hutsuni and Dogo, and the remains of a bunch of other smaller buildings. But the real highlight, which you have to take a boat to because it's on the other side of a mangrove forest, is Husuni Kubwa, the grand palace built by Sultan Al Hassan ibn Suleiman in the 14th century at the height of the city's power. You have to enter by boat at the base of a cliff, and then you climb these worn stairs to the hilltop to the ruins of the palace. There's a giant cliffside octagonal bath, a residence with 100 rooms, a stepped greeting court with candle niches in the wall. But it was a little too ambitious. For some reason we don't know, the Sultan never finished it. The question of who built this city was much debated in the early 20th century. Old accounts said it was founded by a Persian prince who bought the island from a local king for cloth, enough cloth to encircle the whole island, and then destroyed the bridge that connected it to the mainland. This actually turned out to be a classic bit of colonial thinking, that Africans couldn't possibly have built such an international, sophisticated city, a multicultural center, and a global trade network. Later excavations at another of the stone towns on the Swahili coast, Shanga in Kenya, show clearly that the Swahili culture was homegrown in Africa, and it picked Islam and its architectural styles, the minarets, the mosques, the, the domes, to make itself more appealing to Arab traders. They cherry-picked their influences from the successful parts of other cultures until it all came to an end in the 16th century. That's when the Portuguese showed up building forts, demanding tribute, and generally mucking things up. A lot of the stone towns were actually hastily abandoned around this time, and though it's hard to say exactly why, losing control of the trade that made them rich was probably a big part of it. So this is one of the great, little-known and little-studied medieval civilizations of the world, like a Venice of its time, and it's actually not really gone. There's still nearly two million people living on the East African coast who identify as Swahili, and millions more who speak the language. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe. Uh, click here for more videos and tell us what you think in the comments. Where do you think we should explore next?